in this panel, we are moving a bit to different direction. Uh, in the first panel, we explored social technical aspects of FRT. Then the second panel was meant to cover some legal and societal challenges of face recognition technologies. Now what we are doing, we are moving uh, to regional perspective. We're going to have now several panels which are dedicated to dealing with FRT and approaches to FRT in uh, several regions. Uh, in this panel, we will start with Asia Pacific perspectives on FRT, and we have two presentations in uh, this uh, exciting uh, panel. We will start with a presentation of uh, two uh, professors. Uh, this is uh, Hian Li and Peng Shu. Uh, Hian Li, uh, let me present him briefly, is a professor and executive director of the Center of Legal Innovation and Digital Society at the Chinese University of Hong Kong uh, at the Faculty of Law. He has featured on ABC News, BBC News, Bloomberg News, Financial Times, Fortune and South China Monitoring Post as an expert on intellectual property and the internet law. Uh, he is well known and his works have achieved what most of us academics are dreaming of. Professor Lee has been cited by the US Court of Appeals, uh, uh, by U U UK High Court of Justice and the US International Trade Commission. Before starting his career, he was a practicing lawyer in Taiwan. Uh, specializing in technology of business uh, and business transactions, so he has both the academic and the practical background. Uh, then the second speaker in the same presentation is uh, Peng Zhu, who is a postgraduate student in the Faculty of Law of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, I would say he also ho holds a, an amazing CV with uh, fields covering art history, master of music, uh, he practiced law and uh, I mean, he did so many things in different areas and I'm amazed to, to see him here as well. Uh, his current research focuses on comparative analysis of data protection laws and artificial and intelligence with a focus on China's digital governance and competition policy. So let's welcome the two speakers and the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm co-presenting with uh, Professor Lee. Uh, so I'll be covering the introduction and just um, to touch on the first case. Um, for those of you who are interested, sorry, interested in China and who are following what is going on in China, you probably um, would picture this uh, imagery of an old fashioned um, big brother, perhaps with a touch of um, cyberpunk dystopia in your mind. Um, well, I'm here not to challenge that perception if you are picturing this, but I'm um, trying to give um, more nuanced, so to speak, uh, perception of what is um, going on um, in China uh, nowadays. Um, I would say it's a story not without paradoxes and contradictions. What do I mean by this? Um, the first level of contradictions and paradoxes is that it's a story with an element of social progress in the highly surveilled society. So as this work of art uh, suggests, you have people marching um, on the avenue or street of happiness. And by the way, it's a real place in, in Beijing. Um, all the while they are docking their posters just to avoid the security cam. So this is the airy kind of social progress. So that's the first level um, of what I mean by um, paradoxes. And the second level is um, the dual purpose of the law. If you read the legal authorities, you clearly have a sense that the lawmakers are very meticulous about preserving a distinction between the regulation for private use versus regulation for um, public use. So, so it's about preserving uh, or uh, privileging the public's um, power and authority. So this um, work of art to me um, is like 
um, you have something as base, as, as even frightening as a security cam, but once you um, privileging it, elevating it on the piece of pedal, then it starts to have this very strange charismatic uh, appeal. So uh, it's not just about that the technology is disciplinary, the law can also um, be a disciplinary rule. Um, having said this, um, let's go straight into the legal framework. Um, so due to time constraint, I think I will just skim through this page very quickly because it's kind of dry, but um, I will say this, um, the timing for our conference today is brilliant. Um, as you can see, um, the year 2021 uh, sort of concludes the really the formulating stage, not just for the regulation on FRT, but um, data protection regimes more generally in China. Um, so let's go straight into the most salient features. The first, uh, um, I will say is um, there has been this establishment of principle-based approach um, um, drew from uh, internationally shared doctrines, um, data protection, privacy doctrines, you know, um, but here comes the juicy part. Um, in terms of public use, um, basically anything on the ground of security, public security, um, it's, it's okay to go. So there is a big carve out for state purposes. Um, perhaps more importantly, um, there's also a clear disparity in terms of liabilities and also the mode of redress. Um, for state use, uh, if anything goes wrong, the, the law clearly says that um, you go for intra-organization and intra-party sanctions. Um, so um, the first case that we want to talk about is not a case about state use, okay? It's a, actually a private um, action. Um, but it's widely dubbed as the so-called first case, um, first case of, of FRT in China. So the basic facts of the case is actually very simple. This um, he's actually a professor in law. Um, he bought this yearly pass at this local wildlife park, and after that purchase, um, had been informed that uh, they wanted to up, upgrade their system for um, FRT-based functions. Um, and incidentally, they told. Um, um, our um, plaintiff that um, actually the photo he had taken for the first time was enough for them to activate the function. So being a professor in law, he decided that the best reaction uh, was to sue them, right? Um, however, if you read, uh, he appealed once. So the, the case went through both instances, but if you read the judgments carefully, um, there's actually not a big difference uh, there is, however, a, a, a small, um, arguably significant, subtle difference, which is that uh, the, the first court, the lower court, ruled purely on a breach of contract logic, whereas the appellate court um, said, oh, we are dealing with um, facial data, which is personally sensitive, so it requires um, a heightened uh, legal scrutiny. That part that's it, that's the part that is branded, not just a victory for the plaintiff, not just a victory for the judiciary, but a victory for the rule of law in China uh, in this quote unquote um, new era under the current leadership. So it's a symbol of social progress. Um, that is why it's chosen as one of the 10 cases of the year and received uh, full support of the entire propaganda machine. Um, so um, this um, kind of um, comes back to the, uh, my point in the beginning, this um, airy kind of social progress. Okay, so um, I'll stop here and I will quit my PPT. All right, uh, so Alex just uh, uh, shared the first case, uh, which uh, just happened in China, which was about the 
uh, the use of FRT in the private sector. Um, the second case that we are sharing here is more about uh, uh, the use of uh, FRT uh, by the government. Um, so uh, the story also just happened a few years ago. Um, so in November 2019, um, so the Beijing uh, municipal uh, government just decided to implement that FRT in subway stations as part of the so-called security uh, check measures. Um, for those who have been to uh, the subway uh, in Beijing, so you will see uh, they have some kind of like device very similar to uh, the airport. So they need to do that security check when you get into uh, the station. Um, and then uh, there was a, a low professor uh, who is still teaching in Tsinghua University. Her name is uh, Lao Dongyan. So she criticized this decision on her uh, WeChat page. That is basically a, a widely used social media application, just like uh, Facebook, um, after that announcement. So uh, she actually provided a number of viewpoints against uh, that government decision. Um, number one, she said, uh, this is a big decision and there should be some public consultation. So uh, you didn't do that and you just started to do that. Uh, and then um, the subway security was very different from uh, airplane uh, security. Uh, therefore, uh, she didn't think there's a justification for that kind of uh, uh, FTR um, devices uh, in the subway station. Uh, and then uh, that decision uh, was a violation of fundamental rights, according to um, Professor Lau, uh, and it's implemented without uh, the authorization of the law. And lastly, um, she argued that uh, also the proposal was passed uh, uh, based on public security concerns. Uh, it still violates the so-called basic principles of uh, presumption of innocence. So uh, basically, you just assume uh, there might be some criminals among the passengers, and that is against the very fundamental principle uh, in criminal law. So of course, uh, that criticism on WeChat drew uh, wide attention. So what happened after that? Uh, and because of that uh, WeChat uh, criticism, uh, the Beijing government uh, kind of like decided to postpone the whole plan for a while. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, after a few months, uh, Professor Lau's WeChat account was also suspended. Uh, and then after two years, uh, Beijing still started to introduce FRT uh, to several subway stations uh, earlier this year. Uh, but that FRT is not compulsory. So that was adopted on a voluntary basis. Uh, passengers can still uh, decide whether you want your face to be scanned by the device. Uh, but if you get your face scanned and you agree to register your name, uh, you get some benefit, which is that you get an express, express pass. Uh, you can probably uh, get on the train uh, easier and faster, uh, especially during rush hours. Uh, and then the Beijing government explained uh, that facial data was also linked to a vaccination and testing result, uh, also for the purpose of pandemic control. Uh, that was the second case that we would like to share. So what are the takeaways from uh, this background and the two case studies? Uh, so we provide a number of takeaways here. Uh, number one, uh, to be frank, so uh, the case about uh, the Beijing subway station and Professor Lau seems to be uh, very negative, uh, but we need to say, so over the past two decades, uh, you do see there has been some improvement. Uh, individuals control over facial information is now recognized by the court. Uh, this is especially from uh, the first case uh, that introduced by Alex, uh, the Guobin case. Uh, because in that case, the court did say uh, consumers control over facial data is uh, kind of like very important and you need to protect that. Uh, so there is no justification for abuse of the facial data by uh, the business. Uh, and the court also recognized that facial information is more sensitive than other bio uh, information and uh, is improper use and processing will lead to more risk for the data subject. So that is a pretty uh, positive development, but we also need to show uh, the negative side. Um, so if you compare these two cases, you will see, um, so uh, the, the approach uh, to the government use of FRT as opposed to uh, that used by a uh, private sector is very different. Uh, government use of FRT is not subject to uh, substantive legal restriction. And uh, Alex just did mention that previously, and even if there is a violation, uh, the legal consequence is at most administrative correction. And uh, uh, Alex just say that, oh, it's actually just within the administrative body 
of nothing else. Uh, that being said, the government can easily be exempted from any legal liability uh, based on the very vague concept of public security or uh, public safety. Uh, and we do see uh, there's a trend in this country, uh, which is increasing control in the uh, different kind of uh, with different kinds of surveillance uh, devices. Uh, now uh, we see uh, it's actually pretty scary. Uh, more than half of the world's uh, uh, 1 million surveillance cameras are in China. Uh, and uh, just take one province, for example, Fujian. So there were 2.5 billion facial images stored at the uh, police department at any given time. And lastly, um, FRT is just part of China's uh, large scale digital surveillance system. So of course there are some other technologies for surveillance, which include, but not limited to uh, phone trackers, DNA information, et cetera. All right, uh, I'll now uh, give back the floor to uh, Ag thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lee. Thank you, Alex. Uh, really an amazing presentation, especially we were glad to hear the cases you had because as we, until now during this conference, there was just one case which was mentioned. There is so little case law. So we are really glad that you share uh, the cases you had in China. I wanted to ask um, the first speakers, uh, in China, the use of face recognition technologies is indeed more intensive than in many other countries. You cited this number of the cameras uh, of the face images in the system, and it's really, I mean, amazing. Uh, do you have civil society, for instance, opposing that, or is there a certain psychological acceptance? Maybe it's a cultural thing that some countries accept more than government imposed the restrictions and regulation and such technologies as facial recognition technology. Uh, what do you think about that? Alex, you want to go first? Um, well, I think you <laughs> wrote an article on this, right? Um, All right, I, I can um, start uh, briefly. So, um, so Agni, you are certainly right. Uh, this is, of course, widespread in China, but it doesn't mean it is not controversial at all. It is actually very controversial, especially uh, in certain communities, such as uh, low scar legal scholars. So uh, the two cases that we uh, provided are both raised by uh, low professors because uh, they have actually a better sense about human right as well as privacy. Uh, but in terms of the uh, general culture or the awareness of the human right, data protection or privacy uh, is to be frank, not that advanced. So that is actually uh, related to the fundamental perception and the value of human right in the country. So as we understand, so in most of the Western democracies, uh, human rights were first developed to uh, use against the government. But in China, uh, you cannot say there is no human right. Human rights actually in the law, in constitutional law, uh, but uh, the general legal culture in the country is that uh, uh, human right is not uh, used against the government. So instead, the government means the collect in interest of the society. So that makes a big difference. So that's why, uh, of course, we do see it's very controversial. But a lot of people would say, hey, uh, if government is doing that uh, for more important policy goal, uh, such as uh, uh, public safety, security, then I'm fine with that. Uh, because I do believe government do that for me. Uh, and the other very interesting argument uh, that was introduced by the government and accepted by a very large portion of the society is that uh, if you don't do anything illegal, so what are you worried? So uh, of course, for a lot of us who study law, uh, especially rule of law, uh, that is an unbelievable argument. But most of the people who don't have that idea, so they actually can easily buy that argument from the government. Thank you for your answer. Indeed, the very interesting that it's a different perception uh, and different understanding of the same concepts in different regions that has an effect on uh, how people perceive technologies even. Uh, do we have some other questions? I saw somebody raising hand. Maybe I can uh, come with my question to Nessa then. Not an academic question, but like more from practical perspective. It was very interesting to hear how 
well kind of how welcome the police authorities were when you were conducting the research that they opened everything you know open all doors for your research which i think is quite unusual could you tell the secret into their hearts so to say why they trusted you so much that the recommendations and in the report you produce will will be you know the one that you know they were they're not afraid of um well i think they like and they they said this publicly is like that they felt they wouldn't be able like that they were losing public opinion um and that they felt that they needed some transparency um it's something that i think there was some new leadership came in and there's like it's been a, a thing in a couple of areas for that transparency so i mean there's been another big program and research about kind of racial bias which is going on at the moment so um i think they felt that in order to keep using some of these technologies, at least, um, there'd have to be some transparency around use or else that they would lose any social license. Um, but it was something that they've done in a number of, of contexts. Um, but I think, yeah, just that idea that they felt they'd lose, lose the public or not be able to use things because um, there has been quite a number of proposals to reform search and surveillance law and, um, but none of those just seem to be having any movement. So I think they felt they couldn't wait for the law um, and did a number of other kind of transparency things as well. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, the speakers of this panel. Let me now return the microphone, uh, the virtual microphone to my colleague, Monica Zalneruta, who will introduce you our next uh, speaker, keynote speaker. So Monica, please. Thank you very much, Agnes. and thank you, the panelists. It was a great panel, and, and I guess one of the great pleasures of hosting a conference, a global conference like this uh, online, is that we, we, we can have, you know, um, more than one keynote. So welcome, uh, Milton. Um, it's really nice to have you, and I think it's still morning uh, in the US, and it's, it's getting quite late in other parts of the world. Um, I'm really excited to see that we still have a lot of people um, and hopefully some more will join, uh, but we still have over, uh, over 50 people listening. So that's really good. Uh, and I am um, very um, happy to be able to introduce uh, to all of you, uh, uh, Professor Milton Muller, um, who is uh, really a superstar professor. So, so it's just personal connections that made this happen. I'm really grateful to Milton for agreeing to speak here. Um, he's a, he's a professor of political science um, at Georgia Tech, one of the leading um, engineering um, universities and institutes uh, in the world where he um, directs internet governance project. And Milton is a famous uh, scholar uh, on political economy of internet. Uh, and he published three famous and very influential uh, books, at least three, maybe even more now. I have but I'll, I'll, I'll just mention briefly some of his uh, 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 groundbreaking work. Uh, uh, so Will the Internet Fragment, published by Polity Press in 2017, Networks and States, the book that shaped my views a lot, published by MIT in 2010, and also Ruling the Root, uh, early groundbreaking work, published in 2002, all of which discuss uh, the politics and political economy uh, um, of internet governance. And, and Milton has really shaped generations of scholars, I think, in, in, in the field with his uh, very um, diverse methods and approaches that he employs, uh, both theoretical and, and qualitative and quantitative research. So Milton is really uh, uh, a big name in the field and it is my pleasure uh, uh, to introduce him to you now. And I think I'll give the floor to Milton now, and he can tell more about his work. Uh, and we just want to hear about the, you know, public and private space and re renegotiation of the, of the public and private space and facial recognition technology. So, welcome, Milton. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Monica. It's been um, you've really put together an excellent uh, conference, and uh, I really wish I could have heard uh, more of the speeches uh, that were going on at uh, between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. here in the U.S. And in particular, I would have liked to have uh, seen the ones uh, taking the historical uh, technology approach because um, I think it's very important to understand the construction of a uh, surveillance infrastructure uh, using you know, older technologies uh, like uh, fingerprinting and so on. Um, but 
yeah, I thought I should get some sleep tonight before giving the speech. So, so let me uh, uh, share the screen. I guess I will um, have some Another slides. Say, here. We're going to have the recordings uh, of, of the conference. So you'll be able to dig out the, the uh, historical presentation. Indeed, they were really fascinating and I think changed the perspective for many of us. Okay, we have your slides on, and but it's just, it's already the conclusions, maybe. Oh, that's not good. Uh-huh, that's All right. better, yes. There you go. You had a preview. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, I was interested, uh, and uh, uh, clearly that there is a great deal of expertise, uh, specifically about FRT, concentrated here. And I hope I don't uh, duplicate uh, too much, but I do think I'm bringing in a unique perspective on some of the broader conceptual issues, and also on the particular things that are happening in the United States. Uh, so, of course, biometrics, uh, FRT is just one species of biometric digital data, and biometrics refers to the element of the body that can be used to differentiate individuals, and note that I use the term differentiate rather than identify, because it really is about reducing things to digital metrics that can be compared and differentiated. Uh, of course, this includes uh, fingerprints, iris patterns, DNA, or my favorite, the shape of one's ear, as well as the face. And there is also behavioral biometrics uh, that are dynamic patterns unique to individuals, uh, like a handwritten signature or voice recognition. Now, in some ways, it is arbitrary to single out facial appearance in isolation from these other biometrics in terms of the legal and policy issues. But uh, as some of you have already noted, face, facial recognition does have some relevant differences. Now, one is that fingerprints, iris scans, and DNSA, DNA cannot be observed at a distance. Um, they require close contact and, and getting them often requires some cooperation from the scanned person to be useful. Uh, other biometrics do not lend themselves to mass surveillance for that reason in public places as easily as FRT. Likewise, most form of behavioral biometrics require more extensive data gathering and would be more expensive and difficult to support. So if we're concerned with surveillance, it makes sense to focus on FRT. But that's not the most important reason. The most important aspect of FRT is that existing systems of identification already rely on faces. When it comes to driver's licenses, passports, student ID cards, and other kinds of identification, we are already engaged in massive amounts of facial recognition. We're just not using AI and machine learning to do it. So the key aspect of FRT is not really its storage and analysis of the geometry of an individual's face. It is its capacity to link that biometric to other personal identifiers, such as names, account IDs, passport numbers, driver's licenses. And once they're connected to an identifier, FR becomes the gateway to computerized records of behavior, such as where they live, whether they're wanted by the police, bank transactions, and so on. So it's really the surveillance contribution of FRT that is of interest. And the conference is right to focus on its use by the state because the state can make the most consequential uses of that information, such as arresting people, or deporting them, and so on. So surveillance it needs a definition. I think it's important to have a good concept of what that means. And there's the very well-known and famous definition of Professor Leone as the focus, systematic, and routine attention to personal details for purposes of influence, management, protection, or direction. A definition even more suitable for uh, this conference and this presentation comes from Haggerty and Erickson which is the collection and analysis of information about populations in order to govern their activities. And I think that's really what we're talking about is of course, surveillance and particularly biometric recognition as a form of public control, public safety. 
Now, there's a big debate about accuracy and bias uh, in facial recognition technology. Um, many critiques are based on these biases. Uh, this can occur because the training data was too limited or the sample of faces was skewed in terms of gender or race. Now, this problem is like catnip for many in the tech policy community, a technology that disproportionately misidentifies people of color is a huge political red flag, especially in countries like the US with a long history of civil rights struggles and a public dialogue frequently dominated by identity politics. So inaccurate or biased identification is an important problem and does pose specific regulatory or legal issues. But there's a tendency for it to become a kind of a gotcha that short circuits discussion of the more general and fundamental human rights issues associated with FRT. It's important to note that the accuracy of FRT is measurable. And the US National Institute for Standards and Technology or NIST has for several years uh, been doing excellent studies comparing false positive and negative rates of FRT vendors. In fact, it was these studies that flagged and confirmed the race and gender disparities in accuracy. This provided an important, and continues to provide, because they're updating these studies, an important independent benchmark for service selection by governments and improvement by vendors. Now, everything I know about the ongoing development of AI indicates that inaccuracies uh, can be and are being progressively reduced with larger and better training data sets and improved algorithms and through comparative studies such as NIST's. I don't think we can dismiss the technology as being inherently inaccurate or biased, although of course all technologies are inherently imperfect. But a lot depends on how it's trained and even more important on the procedural and organizational aspects of its deployment uh, issues, which I think Nessa delved into really uh, interestingly in the context of New Zealand. So in terms of protecting civil rights, I think it's best to prepare for a world in which FRT will be able to accurately identify people and develop policies and laws based on that assumption. We do need procedures and policies to deal with misidentification, but we need to keep critical context in mind. First of all, inaccurate conclusions happen with any form of identification. Even identifiers as simple as names in text have led to innocent people being placed on no-fly lists because their name matches or is close to that of a terrorist. Second, and this is really important, at least here in the US, racially biased identifications can and do happen when humans are involved. The critique of biased AI often avoids dealing with this fact, but let's look at it squarely in the face, so to speak. Uh, people have prejudices. You do not eliminate them by refusing to use technology. Indeed, it's not hard to think of situations in which AI would be less likely to reach a biased conclusion than decisions made by prejudiced humans. And as an example of that, in the biometric sense, uh, uh, this innocence project in which numerous uh, people who've been uh, convicted of crimes, mostly based on racial prejudice, prejudice have been uh, proven innocence by, by DNA evidence, by a biometric. So to bring this point home, let's take a close look at one of the famous misidentification cases. I don't know whether they've already discussed this or not, but it's a, a big deal here in the US, and that's the case of Robert Julian Borchak Williams. So in October, 2018, somebody shoplifted five watches worth about $4,000 from a store in Detroit. The store had surveillance cameras. Uh, their loss prevention officer reviewed the videos and singled out the person who they thought did it. And a grainy still image of the man that you see here, a black man in a St. Louis Cardinals baseball cap, was given to the Michigan State Police in March of 2019. The police digital image examiner uploaded it to the state's facial recognition database. The system searched in the state's collection of 49 million photos and Mr. Williams 
driver's license photo was among the matches. So what happened next? The state police sent to the Detroit police as an investigative lead report. Uh, the report had a big header in all caps that said, quote, this document is not positive identification. It is an investigative lead only and is not probable cause for arrest. And yet the Detroit police ended up arresting him. They did conduct an investigation, but it was a very lazy one. The police did not check whether Mr. Williams was in the store at the time of the theft. They did not check whether he had an alibi, which he did. They did not check whether he owned a St. Louis Cardinals baseball cap. In fact, he was a Detroit Tigers fan. And all they did was put Williams' photo in an array of five other randomly selected photos and showed them to the loss prevention officer who saw, what, a large black man and picked him out. And then they went out and arrested him. So this case was eventually dismissed, uh, but not before an innocent man was taken off by the police in front of his family in a humiliating fashion and put in jail for 30 hours. Now, inaccurate FRT was certainly a contributing factor in this case. But misidentification by a human also played a critical role. It's tempting to say that bad police procedure was a major factor, but key aspects of the formal procedure were correct. The FRT results were flagged as not probable cause for arrest and an investigation was mandated, but lazy police work short-circuited that procedural uh, correctness. And the bias in this case was not racial bias, it was actually confirmation bias. So it's clear to me that a simple ban on FRT uh, would not necessarily be a net gain for justice in all cases. It's true that without FRT, Mr. Williams would not have been targeted, but it's also possible that some other innocent black man vaguely resembling the suspect would have been. At any rate, it, partly because of cases like this in the US, we have had uh, a number of uh, legal adjustments and policy adjustments at both the state level and the city level. You see here that uh, there are full bans for governmental use in a couple of states, and uh, there are proposed bans in several others. Um, and you see also uh, some regulations proposed for government use. We don't have time to go into the details of all of this diverse uh, uh, diverse approaches taken by these states. As you know, we have 50 of them and um, they can do very different things. Um, I think Washington uh, has a fairly extensive um, form of regulation. What I want to do instead is focus on some more fundamental issues uh, as they relate to the legal context in the United States. So in the US, the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution protects privacy by limiting indiscriminate and arbitrary government searches. Before the government can intrude into or search a private place, it must obtain a warrant. So they're not banned from searching, they uh, must obtain a warrant, and this requires a showing of probable cause to an independent judge. So the legal debate here centers on what constitutes a search and the legal notion of search is based on a separation between so-called private spaces where you could exclude exposure to others and public spaces where you knew you were exposed to anyone and had no protection from state scrutiny. But public spaces in the pre-digital world also had their own kind of privacy. In many ordinary public spaces, we knew we were not in private, but we also knew it was not feasible to be systematically watched or tracked we had what I would call a reasonable expectation of unidentified and untracked movement in public places, or what another scholar has called practical obscurity in public. And this is an important kind of freedom that is not well captured by the idea of privacy. What I'd like to discuss now is the way this concept of search applies to virtual spaces, to data collections. 
So technology has been challenging the definition of what is a search, what is tracking, and what is identification for over 100 years. It renders activities visible, technology does, without physically entering places or intruding on property. Uh, as you may remember a famous case in which uh, early on the U.S. decided that uh, tapping your telephone was not uh, a search because uh, the tap was in the switching office of the telephone company and did not involve an invasion of your home. So the U.S. began detaching the notion of a search from physical property in the 1967 case of Katz versus the U.S., which involved recording outside a phone booth. And I had to find a pretty old picture because phone booths uh, don't <laughs> exist much anymore. Now, this Supreme Court said that the Constitution protects people, not places, but the reasonable expectation of privacy standard was still place-based to a certain degree. The most decisive break with place and the decision most relevant to FRT is Carpenter versus the United States. Police use the third party doctrine to get cell service location information from a mobile phone company. They used it to track an individual's movement over time and discovered a close correlation between the defendant's location and the sites of armed robberies, which led to a conviction. But the Supreme Court actually overturned the conviction. It ruled that a person has a legitimate expectation of privacy, quote, in the record of his physical movements in cell, light, cell site location information, end quote. In effect, the defendant in this case asserted and the court upheld an expectation of unidentified and untracked movement in public. Interestingly, given our focus on biometrics, the court ruled that the cell phone is, quote, almost a feature of human anatomy. Now, one would think that the Carpenter decision has good implication for state abuse of FRT. It certainly seems to rule out governments setting up a systematic infrastructure of FRT in public areas, such as exists in China. But it's also possible that we are not being adequately protected. In the US, driver's license agencies take pictures of our faces. This is one of the most uniform, universal forms of identification in my country. And we have already noted that it was William's driver's license that exposed him to FRT in Michigan. This activity is already pervasive. A local TV station here in Atlanta found that more than 120 law enforcement agencies, including Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the FBI, and the U.S. Marshals Service regularly asked Georgia's Department of Driver Services to run facial recognition against photos of Georgia drivers to see if they match pictures of crime suspects. So how do we define a search? Let's go back to the case of Robert Williams, the man unjustly accused of shoplifting. This is a kind of search he was affected by. Based on FRT results and even a human-based perception of resemblance to the man in the security cam video, he became a suspect in a crime. Hence, the police had probable cause to search his property or his records. But wait a minute. How did he become a suspect? His personal data, indeed the private driver license records of the entire state of Michigan, were searched before he was known to be a suspect. The search happened first, and his status as a suspect happened second. This is exactly the reverse of the assumptions underlying basic constitutional protections in the US. And those are just searches of public official state records the driver's license data. We see a growing number of private applications of digital imaging and FRT technology. I use FRT to unlock my phone. Most of us view this as a convenience and in fact, a pretty good security technology. And because of its convenience and security, we are seeing thousands of applications being developed where faces or other biometrics became, become the chief methods of authentication in limited contexts. And yet the public safety value of private data makes it tempting for it to be co-opted into public systems. Look at the way the UK and Europe are pressuring platforms and handset providers such as Apple to 
engage in client-side scanning of confidential information on the phone to battle child sexual abuse material. I think we can see where this is heading. A more immediate and slightly less creepy example of this private public nexus is security camera data from Internet of Things devices like Ring. Ring is a digitized doorbell that shows who is on your front porch. It does not have FRT capabilities, but it does store images of people, and these can be used in FRT searches, as in the case of Robert Williams. In the USA, Ring reported that 2,161 law enforcement agencies participated in what it calls its Neighbors Public Safety Service, a platform that allows law enforcement agencies to request footage from Ring users. This is a highly effective public safety application. Here in Atlanta, we've seen it used to solve numerous crimes, including murders. Now, once ubiquitous private imaging applications are merged with state law enforcement, FRT has the potential to abolish the expectation of practical obscurity in public spaces. The technology scope and cost are such that it could be anywhere. Cameras set up by the police in a public square, retail stores, private cameras, the Lyft drivers attempts to verify who they're picking up, the security cam in the elevator, all could be imaged and incorporated into large databases that can be searched by state authorities looking for matches with state identifiers. So if the government already has large databases of faces tied to driver's licenses, passports, national ID cards, if private image recording applications are everywhere, and if the commission of a crime justifies searching all of those records to identify suspects, are we really free of mass surveillance? Dear Milton, I just want to say, oh, that's it, conclusions, wonderful. Yeah. Go ahead. So my conclusions are, are listed here. There's really no longer a spatial difference between public and private. It's not through space or place that you find privacy. It's entirely in virtual spaces that digital surveillance takes place. The difference between public and private is entirely constructed by means of technological, legal, procedural, and economic barriers. Uh, privacy protection in a world with high quality image sensors everywhere and AI uh, must be conceived with virtual spaces in mind. We need to closely monitor the inputs as well as the outputs and carefully regulate the way governments access and use the data to draw conclusions. This principle should not be tied to any particular technology or biometric. It should not matter whether it's facial scanning, cell site location, data, or license tags on cars. We can't just blindly block the integration of private data with law enforcement because of the tremendous public safety gains, but we have to figure out how due process, transparency, and quality supervision uh, are guaranteed in this process. Thanks. Thank you so much, Milton. That was a um, really fascinating presentation. And, and I think we learned so much, uh, not only about uh, uh, you know, about, so especially about the specific uh, issues that arise in the U.S. and, and that particular contest, th that was really um, interesting and fascinating. So uh, uh, people now are welcome to post questions to our keynote speaker, and I'll, I'll start with the first one. Um, so I understand, Milton, you have a very pragmatic sort of approach, which is great because many of us are sitting in the clouds, including me, um, uh, you know, hoping for for substantive bans and things like that. So, but what do you see is the way forward, uh, especially with the facial recognition technology? I know you mentioned that it doesn't really matter what kind of technology and, but what do you see would be the way forward to deal with all the, the dangers that you also discussed in your presentation? And then after this question, we're gonna have Andreas to, to pose a question. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think the way forward, and I'm sorry it took long, I timed it yesterday and it was only 21 minutes, but, um, um, what, what Nessa described, uh, and I think what other people have done, uh, we, we could look in more detail at some of these state laws, but they are essentially trying to regulate the procedures that the police must use. And I haven't quite figured out the right approach to take to what would justify a search. I think that's something that we need to think about. But one of those procedures has to be like, when can you actually delve into this a massive database of faces and other biometrics? And, and what constitutes a, an appropriate piece of evidence that allows that kind of a search? 
Uh, also regulation of the quality. I think uh, what happened in Detroit, I didn't have time to say is that the, they, st they said, we're not even gonna do this anymore unless it's a violent crime. And uh, we're not going to allow the use of these grainy uh, still images from uh, bad security cam footage. That, that is simply not going to be allowed. So those kinds of regulations, I think, are the appropriate way to do it. And, and in particular, finding appropriate criteria to even allow the search in the first place. Thank you so much, Milton. And now, Andreas, you, you may pose the question. Thank you. OK. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. Um, I was particularly intrigued by the expectation to remain anonymous in a sufficiently uh, large gathering of people. Um, and I'm taking a wild guess here, but I would venture to say that it's got limitations in the sense that you first need a sufficiently large gathering. So if we think of rural communities, for example, it may be um, that uh, if you go on a space there and even about public space you may rather expect that people would know you and i would also and that's also rather a guess say that say 200 years ago in most communities that wasn't the case so there you could rather expect that people might know you and the, my question would be twofold one whether you would share that intuition and b if that has any bearing on the legal status that you would give to the expectation you just described yeah, I think it's the question, of course, yeah, in a smaller community, you're moving around and you don't, uh, you don't expect privacy in the sense that people would recognize you and they'd say, oh, there's Milton going to the grocery store again. But uh, I'm talking about the tracking by the state, by, by public authorities, right? That's, uh, and that's, again, a systematic kind of what are you doing over a period of time? Uh, you really don't expect that and you really shouldn't expect that in the sense of a, a normative, you know, who has business tracking you. Um, so if it's a private investigator that's been hired by your wife to see if you're cheating, um, you know, they're going to follow you around, but they don't have a right to, you know, put a tracking device on your car, even though with, with this Apple device now, they, they may be doing that. And um, I, I think you're right. It's, it, the, there's not a pure expectation of utter privacy when you're in public. It's just that you don't expect the state or some public authority to be tracking your movement. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, we can give a, a round of applause to Milton. That was a great um, presentation. Uh, thank you, Milton, so much. And we're going to be looking forward to, to your work in this area. Um, and um, I'm going to get in touch with more, more, um, information too um, about if the opportunities to collaborate further on this.